We'd like to structure this conversation a bit to give you the broad range of, of the material that's in the book and, and our experiences. And so we're going to begin at the beginning uh, in the way that Dexter did and his crossing the border. And I wanted to start by asking Anne, when you got there, first of all, why did you sign up? Did you volunteer? Were you assigned? And what did you think you were coming to do? Um, well, I volunteered. Uh, I think Iraq was, I say this whenever people ask, why would you do it? Um, I think covering Iraq was and is the purest expression of why many people become journalists, because it's a chance to bear witness to a situation that not everybody can get there to see, and sort of as a representative of the public to see for yourself on the ground what's going on, judge it for yourself, and uh, to hopefully responsibly inform a policy debate that, that's a life and death debate, not only for America, but for Iraq and... and uh, for foreign policy in general. So um, I I felt that at the beginning, before anything happened, and I felt that even more, the longer it went on, the more we saw the mistakes and the difficulties and and problems. Um, So, and of course, as many journalists experienced, it became, and we'll talk about this, it became frustrating as it became harder to do that. But I still feel that, that journalists are still doing a lot and that it's, it's still valuable. Um, So I went in uh, right after Saddam fell. I was not embedded. I drove in with some colleagues. And uh, what I thought I was going to be covering, I mean, I certainly uh, had already, I had been covering the Central Command headquarters in Qatar during the war. And you could all, you could all, during the invasion, and you could already see that things were not clear straight answers weren't being given, um, and that things were a lot more complicated than the administration might have portrayed at the beginning. But it's but when, when we went in, you felt... Uh, this is another version of what Dexter described. I, I always compare it to uh, having a Band-Aid ripped off of a society. It was both exhilarating and painful what had happened, and people were kind of in shock that that Saddam was suddenly gone, that suddenly American troops were occupying their country. Um, and I had covered the collapse of the Soviet Union and, and the, the uh, beginning of, of the new Russia. And I sort of imagined that there would be some kind of process of national self-examination of the kind that went on after the fall of the Soviet Union. And you could see this a little bit at the beginning, that people were amazed at the things that they suddenly could talk about with each other. I witnessed people confronting each other on the street and saying, you did this to me when you were the uh, Bathist head of my office, and you made my colleagues spit on me because I didn't respect Uday Hussein enough, or you know, these, these anecdotes that were just pouring out of people. They weren't even telling them to me. I just happened to be standing there. You would see families going to a cemetery and digging up the bones of family members that they had just found who had been missing for de- for decades, who had been disappeared by the secret police. And I remember seeing a guy standing in a grave of this loose, sandy soil, pulling out fistfuls of ribs that belonged to his brother and taking them to be buried in Najaf. So the, the, it seemed like this vast opening that was going on. But within days and weeks, you could see that there actually was not going to be a safe space for that kind of discussion to go on, because there was a failure to create um, to create a safe environment for people to really be honest with themselves and with each other without fear of retribution. Um, so that that was one story that I expected to cover that that we sort of haven't really seen. That so it was just a tiny, tiny moment in the beginning. Yes, I, I remember when you could go and buy videotapes that all of a sudden appeared in the markets, and it was of assassinations of people who had no idea that that's how their loved ones had been killed. So they'd take the videotape home and they'd, there would be their brother sitting somewhere where they'd put a, a grenade in his lap and that's how he died. And this was the first time for them to know. Ali, you probably have a more interesting story than any of us because, as Dexter said in his writings, uh, I'm sure, and you found a translator right away, I did too, we arrive... Uh, and we invade your country, we journalists, and what did you think about us 
as you saw us starting to work. Um, I returned back in June 2003. I was in Yemen, I returned back, and I gained my, uh, my uh, profession again as a physician in Baghdad Medical City. And we were seeing journalists coming to the, um, to the hospital every now and then asking, asking these questions. By that time, we were thinking it, they were silly questions. Um, and we, I mean, to be honest with you, uh, we are a suspicious society. We are a suspicious country. We suspect everyone. We were thinking every journalist is American, every American is a CIA, and they were trying to get these questions, these answers from us. We are suspicious about journalists at the beginning. Um, but I, I mean, I remember that's, that was my impression from the people that were, uh, were around me. But then by the end of 2003, I uh, changed from medicine to um, to being interpreter, uh, translator, uh, at that time for the Financial Times. And that was the changing moment for me, seeing um, uh, Western journalists going to the far, uh, uh, farthest point in, in the villages, in the, uh, uh, in the cities outside Baghdad, in the south and the north. And I was asking myself, uh, why they're doing this? Aren't they crazy just to go for the sake of the story to that place or to that place? And then gradually, uh, I changed my mind. Um, I was uh, completely taken by Western journalists and uh, their courage to go to these places and getting this information from the people that turned to be great stories and, and great even tales that should be told to the people outside. So we were thinking, we were suspicious, but if you remember by... Um, at the very beginning, uh, uh, say, uh, especially after the, after the capture of Saddam, I think we, we opened ourselves to the media more and more. That's what I think after that. We started talking freely. Um, I realized people were um, welcoming journals everywhere they see them and just telling them stories and stories. Did you learn things about your country that surprised you? Because what you get to do as a journalist is go th- see things that, as a normal citizen, you wouldn't see. Exactly. Um, I was surprised um, after working as a translator that my country is, is a different place than I, what I thought. Uh, we have all these different kinds of sex. I, I mean, this is something I know from, from reading history books, but to experience it myself, to see the people and their suffering and see, to listen to them and what they're saying... Uh, you know that this place uh, of the country that I used to visit, but now when I visit as a, a translator, um, I listen to the people and listen to them. They're telling me different things than that I would have listened as a citizen. Or a doctor. I, or as a doctor. Um, they were amazing. They were, I mean, uh, I learned a lot. I saw my country in a different way. I would think so. Elizabeth, was it different as a television correspondent in the early days because you were more visible than everybody else. You had to actually go out in the street with a camera, so there was no, it was obvious who you were. <clears throat> I think um, uh, it, te- a television camera has become a bigger and bigger handicap as time has gone on. I think at the very beginning of, uh, after the invasion was the time I felt freest and least encumbered and least endangered by the camera. And that just uh, is a reminder of how free we were to go around how free of um, a fear of retribution and and general violence, um, and in a lot of ways it was a privilege to have a television camera because you could really not t- turn it on and end up with images that were going to be riveting in the West. It was, um, in some ways, the most exhilarating period of West we- of journalism. O- for me, because because every night I knew that our audience was thirsting for the pictures that our cameras would deliver, so that was that was brilliant, and I I think nobody was paying attention really to to television cameras. I, I can remember going into the two eighth nuclear plant uh, when it was being looted. Uh, f- somebody had told us that the um, <clears throat> that this uh, nuclear installation, which had been under the uh, uh, supervision of the IAEA, um, had actually been overrun by looters, and it wasn't being guarded by the American military, and that we should go out there and take a look. 
And it was supposed to be ultra high security and whatnot, but in fact, we just climbed up these great earth berms on the outside and took some big wide shots from the top and then climbed down and found a hole in the fence. And sure enough, there were all these people um, coming in to steal the, the barrels full of uranium yellow cake, but they didn't want the uranium. They wanted the barrels to take them home uh, to use to store drinking water in. I mean, it was just a, just a, a mind-boggling story. Um, and, and we came in and out uh, with the military watching us and the looters watching us, and pff, nobody said boo to us. It was a time of extraordinary freedom. Oh. 